Good morning. Good morning. If everybody can take their seats and get settled, that'd be great. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 13th annual Rothstein Lecture. Thank you in advance for silencing and putting away your electronic devices and giving our speakers your undivided attention. The Joshua Aaron Rothstein Class of 05 Memorial Lecture was established by Nancy and Stephen Rothstein in memory of their son, Josh, who was tragically killed during his sophomore year at Lake Forest Academy. By establishing the lecture, the Rothsteins honor Josh's memory, his kind deeds, his entrepreneurial accomplishments, and the depth of character that he demonstrated daily in his interactions with family, friends, and strangers. The Rothsteins also celebrate Josh's life, guided by ethics, dignified by sound character, dedicated to community service, and committed to living inclusively and inspiring others to do the same. For 13 years now, the fund, has, uh, the fund established by the Rothsteins has brought a wide range of speakers to Lake Forest Academy and has, in honor of Josh, had a lasting impact on all members of the LFA community. Now, to introduce today's speaker, I would like to welcome to the stage Josh's mother, Nancy Rothstein. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dolby. It's an honor to be in front of the LFA community today. Today marks the 13th annual Joshua Aaron Rothstein Memorial 05 Lecture. When Josh died in October of his sophomore year, our family knew we wanted to perpetuate his legacy at Lake Forest Academy, a school he loved and where he was thriving. So we endowed this lecture series to bring knowledge, information, inspiration, and thought-provoking topics to the LFA community, with a caveat that the lecturer and the lecturer would reflect a character value or something of value to Josh. Who knew then that I would be introducing today his beloved sister, Caroline, to honor her beloved brother? What strikes me most is how Josh's spirit must be sparkling, knowing that her journey has led her here, today, now. What inspires me most are those individuals who transform adversity into enriching and improving the lives of others. Both Caroline and her sister Natalie, who's in the audience today, epitomize this quality in their chosen professional paths, requiring dedication, strength, vision, intelligence, and faith. I'm humbled by Caroline's talent, by her ability to weave words into meaning, be they written in her journalistic endeavors or spoken through her poetry, performance, and teaching, which she shares today with you at LFA. Caroline began her spoken word poetry quest at the University of Pennsylvania, adding a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. Whether being tweeted by Lady Gaga for a piece that inspired her, or going viral on BuzzFeed with fat is not a feeling, Caroline grabs attention. She's authentic, bold, brave, astute, and vibrant. I'm blessed to be her mother and moved and very grateful to LFA for what I'm about to witness. Caroline honoring Josh and his legacy. Good morning, Lake Forest Academy. How are you all doing today? There are like 500 of you out there, and that, no offense, sounded like less than 100. So Lake Forest Academy, how are you doing this morning? Awesome. So I can't just like dive into poems. That would be really silly. 
I'm just gonna like be here with you all in this moment and we're gonna collectively honor the magnitude of what's happening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you into my heart and my mind and my body and what I'm going through, which is thank you, mom. Thank you, Mr. Dolby. Thank you to everyone who made it possible for me to be here today. And what's so bizarre is like one of the reasons I'm here today is my brother who went here, who is not with us in body, but is very much with us in spirit and legacy. And so you have to understand the last time I was in this building was 13 years ago when my brother died and I came to the really stunning and beautiful memorial that his classmates and the faculty and the school put together to honor Josh's legacy. So I haven't been here on this campus in all those years. And the journey I've been on in the last 13 years has, has led me to, to this, what I'm gonna share with you today. And this art form, spoken word poetry, and how I found my voice in writing and performing. And what's so bizarre is that I hadn't found this art form before my brother died. And so, so much of who I am professionally, as a performer, I've traveled and performed all over the world for high schools, colleges, universities, you name it. And, and somehow this feels like the most important moment we're sharing together right now, this stage today. So I'm gonna tell you about my journey, not only in the last 13 years with this art form, but also the journey that I was going through when I was your age, before my brother died. And, and what it means for me, I have this tagline I came up with when I was a junior in high school. I went to Nutrier and also to boarding school in Europe. And when I was a junior at Nutrier, I was sitting on the phone with my friend John. And John and I were talking about this class at Nutrier for seniors called Great Books. And Great Books was this English class. And they had two major papers that they wrote every year. One. What's the meaning of life? You know, just like really easy questions. <laughs> Instead of like, oh, what's Hemingway saying in this book? It's like, what's the meaning of life? Which is like a lot. And then the other question, also no big deal. Do you believe in God? Can you, like these were the main questions for this class. And so John and I as juniors were like thinking about, okay, what are the seniors thinking about? Cause we're gonna be like cool intellectual juniors trying to think like the seniors, right? And so we're asking each other, what is the meaning of life? And I come up with this tagline out of nowhere, and I say, for me, the meaning of life is to discover your core and nurture it. I don't really know where it came from, just like maybe out of my core, but I'm bump chink, right? And, and so I thought, okay, the meaning of life is to discover your core and nurture it. And I also believe that everything happens for a reason. And I'm 16 years old when I say all this, and I would be 19 when Josh would die. And one of the most important decisions I made after Josh died was to not change what I thought the meaning of life was. And so with that, I'm gonna share a poem with you that I wrote my senior year of college, which was 10 years ago now. So that lets you know that I'm 32. I'm just gonna put it out there. I'm not afraid to say my age. And, and it is about my experience uh, struggling and recovering from, struggling with and recovering from, we gotta have that like double preposition situation going for the English folks out there. Struggling with and recovering from a decade long eating disorder. And this is called fat. And let me also say that I am, if I didn't really make it clear, honored to be here with every single one of you sharing space, thank you. Give your head, yes, a round of applause for yourselves, thank you. I am not fat. It took me 22 years to purge words onto a page. The same way I purged my body into stomach ulcers, popped eye blood vessels, and missing tooth enamel. 22 years to tell the tale of my bulimic, anorexic, and disordered eating hell. 
And I've walked barefoot through tiled deserts of bathrooms to find the mirage of my distorted body image staring up at me from the tainted water in the toilet. I used to daydream about freedom. I used to daydream about appreciating the abundance of food around me. I used to daydream about eating dinner without wanting to kill myself. And that like the society, I wish to heal and explain. I too someday would change. So I've unchained the melody of my dirge sung soul and patched layers of karmic candle wax to mend the stomach holes. I'm free. Free from sneaking out of algebra and trigonometry to vomit elegantly into a toilet paper filled toilet during a busy passing period so that no one could hear me. Free from credit cards of pay for wasted food crumpled into white garbage bags in the gutter across the street from my driveway. Free from dry skin and shedding hair. Bleeding skin and death scares because food gave me power to inject order into a world of chaos. Food gave me the love and security I was afraid to find in my sexuality. Food could remedy the abandonment I felt from my father's excessive traveling to make the excessive amounts of money I would vomit in the toilet. But this is not a poem about struggling through thousands of breakfasts, lunches, and dinners when thousands struggle without breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is not a poem about millions of tears as my fear-encrusted fingers lay mangled, shaking, twitching on the bathroom floor with fear and insecurity when millions of children are held captive, shaking with fear and no security. This is not a poem about the guilt of a privileged disorder because I was often told that I was selfish for an uncontrollable force coaxing me to stick my fingers down my throat. This is a poem about context about how I can't formulate linguistic ink blots to tangibly articulate the deadly pain that lived inside me, about playing Russian roulette with my esophagus as my gun barrel fingers triggered tragedy down my throat, about self-deprecating stares in the mirror of a red-faced terrorist hijacking my digestive system from within, about how my eyes have learned to make love to the lower left corner of my torso, and the sun sets in the crevices of cellulite in my thunder thighs. This is a poem about the regurgitated traumas that I cannot digest, and at best, this is a poem about how I am not fat. Thank you. Thank you. So, I know we're in a school, but we're not in a library. So if you're feeling something, you can stomp your feet, snap your fingers, clap your hands, ooh, ah, wow, I, wow, you know, whatever you're feeling. You know, this is a conversation we're having. I'm not just like throwing words at you. So please feel free if you're feeling something to let, to let yourself and the world know. I, thank you. So, so that poem, like I said, I had an eating disorder for 10 years. So from ages 11 to 21, I struggled with various kinds of an eating disorder, I, a cocktail of eating disorders, if you will. Uh, and, and I'm now, like I said, I'm 32, so I've been fully recovered now for over 11 years. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I regularly get the question, like literally in my Facebook inbox the other day, how did you stop binging? How did you stop purging? How did you recover? And that's like a really loaded question because it's different for everyone. But what I can say for me is that, in, do, have you learned this sort of like in my experience, you know, I statements, right? So in my experience, the way that I realized that I didn't want to hurt myself anymore was a lot of therapy, love therapy, therapy's great. A lot of writing and performing, writing, performing for me, great. Yoga, meditation, all great things. This thing called intuitive eating, super great. But at the core of this choice to live were two things. One, I recognized the fragility of a body. And two, I realized that I loved myself which is like this, you know, self-love, self-love, love yourself. That's like a very abstract concept. But, but at its core, it was, like I said, it was realizing that I didn't want to harm my body anymore. And so it's impossible for me to separate my brother Josh's death from my recovering from an eating disorder. 
Because when somebody you love doesn't have a body anymore, you start to realize how literally vital, like that word vital is <laughs> like life important. Anyone who wants to define vital is welcome to. Vocab is not my strength. I pretend it is because I'm a poet, but it's all metaphors. I really don't know what I'm saying. Um, I, <laughs> I realized like, how, how fragile this thing was, and I realized that I did love myself, and I didn't want to hurt myself anymore. So that process occurred over many years. But the big, like, epiphany awakening that I wanted to recover and heal was my junior year of college at the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the other things that was going on during that time was I was madly in love with one of my friends. Like, super in love. But do we know, do we know what unrequited love is? Does anyone want to define unrequited love? Friend zone, thank you. <laughs> that, is, that is one synonym. <laughs> Friend, thank you for that. So, <laughs> fr love it. Fr friend zone is definitely a synonym for unrequited love. And to break it down a little further for those of you who are not yet reading Shakespeare, unrequited love is, uh, you know, when you love someone and they don't love you back, right? And so, even though I had this, like, unrequited crush on my friend, and we were totally in the friend zone and still are, uh, I somehow this like love poem came out of me. And the coolest thing, I'm gonna share this love poem with you and then tell you what I've learned in the aftermath of the writing it. So I wrote this when I was like 21 years old. Uh, and um, yeah, unrequited love for you. It's all gonna matter, I promise you. It's like gonna come back together. We're like piecing together this puzzle. Just wait for it, right? For you. I wanna melt purple violets and yellow roses into the arch of your back and run daisies over the course of your childhood. Rest my hand limp on the porcelain of your cheek and mouth Sanskrit words into the apex of your breath so that our souls can remember the first lifetime that they met. Plant acorns into the skin of your upper lip to catch autumn every time I look into your eyes and see summer caving in. Brush oxygen onto the concave of your collarbone so that the next time I kiss you there, I can still breathe. Sketch waterfalls with blue and gold colored pencils into the side of your stomach to remember the source of the ocean I tread water in every time you're near. Dance on the thresholds of your earlobes. Sing to the rhythm of your heartbeat's melody. Compose symphonies of your laughs. Fly to the inner walls of your thoughts and attach them to my thoughts with a bungee cord so that the elasticity of eternity doesn't shatter the moments we spend together in this lifetime with these bodies. And all I ask in return is that you hold me like the miracle of divinely heard redemption songs on the crux of the morning sunrise. I wish on every star that you'll come throw rocks at my window every picturesque daydream, every self-fulfilling prophecy from a bystander that morphs into a lifetime epiphany, every lush mountain range, every poem, every poem, every poem I want to share with you eternally. But sometimes fate chuckles in my eyelids as reality gives birth to infinity, reminding me that you are my soulmate. And the feeling in my gut like a dirty dish towel wringing out restless doubt was but an uttering of the inner workings of destiny. I fell in love with you when we met. I want to wrap enlightenment into a box of gold and place it in the palm of your hand so that the rest of my life can start tomorrow with you. Thank you. So here's what's cool about this poem. So I wrote this, and the person about whom it was written had, had, he claims he had no idea. Yeah, right. But everyone else totally knew it was about him. And years and years later, um, when we are both out of college and I no longer am madly in love with this friend um, and we're totally, you know, consensually in the friend zone, I, uh, I, I let him, um, I share some writing that I'd done with him. And, th and I told him, I was like, by the way, in order to read this writing, you have to know that I was totally in love with you when we were in college. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, right, you totally knew. He's like, I swear, I had no idea. And he goes, did you ever write a poem about me? I was like, yeah, that 
that that love poem, he's like, no way, that's about me? That's, I love that poem. I was like, yeah, that's about you. So, so this is what's called, I like to call this like radical friendship, right? So here we are, we're adults, we're in our th early 30s, and we have a conversation recently about, about a year ago about this poem. And, and he said what was really cool for him was the experience of knowing that someone could feel that way about him when he maybe didn't have that much confidence about himself and how that reflected back to him on helping him elevate his confidence. Do you understand what I'm saying? That like, he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If Caroline can feel this way about me and I, I'm a little insecure, then there must be something I'm missing in how I should feel about myself. Cool, right? Which is why like, I'm really down with like honesty and radical friendship and stuff, like I was saying, right? And so that's like a key component for me in my recovery journey was, I, I always get really nervous when people are like, I am healed and survived because of all these other people. That makes me nervous because I really feel like that discover your core and nurture it thing, like your core, who you are, that needs to come from you, right? Like I, I really feel that we are all complete within ourselves and everything we need to heal and to know is actually like we're geniuses up in this whole thing we have, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it's able to do or not able to do, we have all the resources inside ourselves to, to figure out like who we are and to know what that core is and then to nurture it. And so what I do think is possible is that we reflect back to each other what we sometimes need to know about our own core. So for me, knowing that I had a lot of friends, I was really grateful for that, that I had a loving family. Look at this like incredible loving family, like multiple generations in the front row. I had this hands up for my family. I had, I have this amazing, loving family. I had, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd worked really, really hard to get there. So I was like, you know, I'm at like a, an Ivy League school in Philadelphia. I'm running a bunch of organizations on campus. I have a lot of really close friends. I've discovered this thing called spoken word poetry. I'm writing, I'm doing activism. There is so much love coming at me. It was time to like bridge that gap and decide that, wow, if all these people love me, there must be something worthy to love. So I'm gonna cultivate that from within. So that was like a key part for me. I'm gonna, how y'all doing? I'm, I'm gonna stop in the middle of the sentence and then ask you how you're doing, right? You're good, you're good? Any, any like, we're gonna do some Q&A later. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep flowing. Um, so, so I'm gonna share this next poem. Um, and if it's not totally inappropriate, it's extremely hot up here, so I'm gonna take off this sweater, but I'm not being fresh or weird. I just like, you know, I have this dress on and it's really hot, so I'm gonna take off my grandmother's sweater. Um, she's in the front row in a beautiful red sweater. Here we go. I'm just gonna fold it so it's nice. And fold it again, like so. Lovely. Great, we good? We go I'm great. We good? Okay, great. So, this poem um, is called Life Worth. And it is about Josh. And it is about all of us. And it is about like anyone that's ever passed away. And it is about human rights. And I don't need to tell you what it's about because I'm gonna share it with you. But what I am gonna say is that last week, uh, a friend of mine in the poetry, I live in New York City, and uh, a friend of mine in the poetry community in New York passed away unexpectedly in his sleep. And so his funeral was yesterday. And I was not at his funeral because I was on an airplane to come here and be with all of you incredible, beautiful, brilliant humans. And so as I share this today, I'm also thinking of my friend 
A Train, who was also from Chicago. So we were like these Midwest pe poets in New York City. And there's a lot of like really sad, violent things that are happening in the world. And there's a lot of natural disasters that happen that we can't control. And I can't help but think every day, like I don't understand how there is unnecessary and senseless violence when mortality is a real thing anyway, right? And when like natural disasters are gonna happen anyway. So to me, it's like adding any extra violence when it's already so much to cope with the natural order of things. That makes me real sad. So this is called Life Worth, and it is for A-Train, for my brother, for anyone that's ever lost anyone in body, but hopefully not in spirit, or whatever beliefs that you may or may not have, I honor that, and that is beautiful. Um, this is for all that. He just bought a pair of shoes. $100 sneakers, shopping bag clad right hand. He walks down Central Street in Highland Park, Illinois, a brand name sidewalk with affluent stores. He knocks on the pharmacy door window for a bag of pretzels and a Gatorade, but they wave him away. It's 4 p.m. on a Sunday, and they're closing up shop. A senior from his high school pulls an illegal U-turn. An elderly man stops short to avoid collision, skids onto the curb, and throws my brother into the side of a store building. His head cracks open, his eyes close shut, and his sneakers fling into the air as his spleen develops cuts. They do brain surgery, put him on respirators. Rabbi Mason prays by his ICU bedside, but he never wakes up. I'm crouched over his bedside, begging him, yelling at him, Josh, wake up, Josh, please wake up. He was only shoe shopping. Walking side by side teenage girls that purchase emaciation on a hanger which is really just a metaphor for shirts sewn in sweatshops by starving children. And studies say that executing killers costs more than keeping them in prison for the rest of their lives, and funeral prices are on the rise. Cremation packages start at 2,000. The average casket is 6,000. $28 a month to purchase an orphan on the internet. 13 bucks for a Japanese picture bride to weed the fields and strip sugarcane. Not too much for a mail order bride, Choose her body shape, her nationality, and human pedigree. And since this is an unregulated business, I don't have fancy statistics to insert here about how many women are bought by strangers yearly. As we get a price check in aisle five to bargain lives, we further judge when they die. My family goes to trial so the killers can pay for our loss in insurance. There's no way to judge, but the judge sits there asking me, how much was his life worth? My 15-year-old brother had $25,000 in savings for selling Beanie Babies at 100 times their cost on an eBay auction block, $650 to purchase an African teen on a southern auction block. How much is a life worth? We purchase human beings from fruitless trees. We consume material and will them to our offspring. We hang child labor on mannequins. We dangle death next to cash registers. We kill children in storefront windows and judge their worth in finances. Even though the only bank in heaven is a locked vault of karma, the only currency in heaven is a set of intangible beliefs, the only worth in heaven can't even be proven, how much is a life worth? He was 15 years old, shackled, standing on an auction block. He was 15 years old, walking happy on a sidewalk. He was 15 years old, starving, sewing in a sweatshop. How much is a life worth? Josh, wake up. Josh, please wake up. How much is your life worth? It's worth waking up daily to face the misery of death's reality. It's worth becoming straight edge to never miss a single moment of sobriety. It's worth my living breath to overcome death. Josh, you are what my life's worth. Thank you.
That is by far and away the slowest I have ever done that poem, for whatever that is worth. Um, let's like take a few breaths together, just like a deep, we're gonna do three. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, one more. Inhale, exhale. I'm gonna open it up for some questions. And I'm gonna I'm a professional oversharer, so um, whatever feels comfortable for you to ask is okay by me. So I'm open to any questions you have about parts of my journey and my story that I've shared with you today, questions you might have about the art form of spoken word poetry, questions you might have about my brother, anything in between. I'm open to that and hope that we can have a bit of a conversation now before I close out with a poem before we end. So anything at all, I think I can see all of you. And so I hope that anyone that sees hands raised will also give a heads up. Oh, look at the lights. And the theater said, let there be lights. And there was, and it was good. Did anyone get that reference to the Torah or the Bible? <laughs> Whichever your <laughs> preference is. Yes. Ooh. So what's the meaning of life is the question. For me, or like in general, like I'm an all-knowing person. For me. So for me, the meaning of life remains to discover your core and nurture it. And some things that I've added to that big tagline are, um, so I took a solo road trip after I graduated from college. I lived in Atlanta. Um, for six months waitressing in a sports bar because I figured I would make good money working at a sports bar in the South during football season, which was a true hypothesis. And then I funded this solo road trip around the United States. And by the time I got to California, I was like sitting on Stanford University's campus waiting for my friend who worked in admissions to get out of work. And my friend from Atlanta called me, and in her southern accent, she was like, all right, girl, I know how your brain works. Top five epiphanies from your road trip. And the top five epiphanies were, one, that we are all complete within ourselves, and we don't need any external thing or person to fill us and to make us feel whole. Two, um, that this notion of, like, God or a higher power is unconditional love, and unconditional love is what will create social justice and change and world peace. Um, and that was sort of like three-ish too. And then uh, the fourth thing was that for me, my uh, purpose in life was to be a writer and a performer and an activist. And the fifth was that I was on the right path and that everything was happening for a reason, which is a complicated fifth thing when bad stuff happens, right? It's like, how do you wrestle with everything happens for a reason when some sad stuff happens? So. To me, it's that tagline of discover your core and nurture it with those five bullet points below it. And that's really the practice for me that I go on. You know, Have, has anyone read The Alchemist? By, okay, that's an amazing book by Paolo Coelho. Am I saying his last name right, Coelho? No, yes. Okay, ish, I can see it on the page. Um, and, and that is about finding your sort of universal purpose and going along with it. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? Anything else? Yes. Hello. Yo. Great. So am I. Amazing, clarifying question. I apps, thank you for that. I absolutely do think we are affected by the people around us. So 
let's slow it down and maybe break it down. So this like core, we are complete within ourselves. It's more of a like, like I don't need, um, it's like this notion of feeling incomplete without other people. That's where I get nervous, but it's knowing that how I feel complete is that give and take shared experience. Because if I lived alone, there's a, a book, what's it called by, um, uh, Into the Wild is this great book, and it was made into a movie many years ago. And this guy, like, goes off and lives in the wilderness of Alaska by himself. And he, he ends up, this is a true story, and he ends up eating a poisonous plant. And as he's dying alone in the wilderness of Alaska, he writes into this journal he was keeping, happiness is best when shared. And I feel that, that, like, I'm not advocating for a world of, or a life for myself or anyone to like go sit alone in the wilderness, although it's like great to go be alone in the wilderness once in a while, but like <laughs> I'm not advocating for that because so much of who I am, if not like 98% of it, is an ongoing conversation I'm having with the world and the people around me, and that reflects back into me. And so it's about understanding my core well enough to know how to respond and navigate and negotiate that which is happening around me. Like, like you know, like my sister's sitting here, like she's, I'm just gonna call her out, hey Nat Natalie, love you. Um, she's my best friend, and I like to say that she is like the most important protagonist in my narrative, right? Like, I, like this woman is like everything to me. And it's not like, I feel like I don't know who I am without her, but I know who I am because of her, right? It's that it's like how to facilitate language that has me in conversation with everything around me, but the process of coming to understand the importance of my sister and why she's so important to me and our brother for that matter is knowing who I am on a deeper level internally. Does that help clarify and make sense? Yeah, but I, I mean, hello, it takes a village to raise me. I don't know what pair of shoes to put on in the morning until I text five people. It's true. I'm not making that up. But, but deep down, I know that, like, I want to write books and perform all over the world, and I know that in me. It doesn't mean I'm not regularly communicating with the people in my life to help me make, get there, right? But I... I also know myself well know enough to know that I need to text five people to decide what to do for dinner tonight, you know? Thank you. Great questions. Yes. Yes, you. Whew. Who is my soulmate and where are they right now? Um, great question. So <laughs> I... I used to believe that we all had like one soulmate and now I kind of feel like we've got like, has anyone read Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Cat's Cradle? Okay, so there's this thing in, in Cat's Cradle spelled K-A-R-R-A-S. I've always said that out loud in my head as Karas, Karas, whatever it is. And, and the notion of this thing is that we all have soul groups and like these crews of soulmates that we roll with and we travel with and it could be everything from your best friend to a stranger you meet on the street. And so I definitely feel like I've got a soul crew and lots of friends and family members that fe feel like my soulmates and maybe even ex-partners that feel like soulmates. And I do also feel that like there's this uh, notion in Judaism of a beshert, who is your like partner uh, soulmate. And I, I also feel like that person exists. I have no idea who they are or where they are or if I've ever met them. So, like, check back in with me in five years and, like, hopefully we're married or something with children. Um, but right now, I don't know who they are. <laughs> Great question. Do you see all the English references? Nobody asked me to do this. It's just happening. It's just, like, in me. Books. Yes. That is a great question. What are the ways of nurturing one's core? So, um, this varies for everyone. So some examples of what nurturing one's core has been for me are like super deep, intense conversations with people in my life. So I'm like one of those people. I also like spent some time at boarding school. So maybe after lights out, we were sitting on our beds talking late into the night, 
breaking my sound code. Um, I'm like, so, so for me, like the biggest thing that nurtures my core is um, quality time with people I love um, and deep, deep conversations, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, whatever it may be. Um, the outdoors really nurtures my soul. Road trips nurture my soul. Uh, concerts really nurture my soul. Dancing, writing, performing, um, eating, baked goods seems to nurture my soul. Um, shout out to baked goods. <laughs> really love those chocolate chip cookies. Um, so it, you know, taking long walks, riding the M5 bus from downtown Manhattan up to Harlem where I live really nurtures my soul. People think it's so weird, but I don't know. That feels like being at a spa, but it just like does because I'm on the bus for an hour and it feels good. <laughs> I, don't ask. It just, But I discovered it, and so then I kept riding it to nurture my soul, you know? Um, but it varies for everyone, like sports doesn't really do it for me. And then I watch people whose like souls are so nurtured by sports and it looks a lot like how going to a concert is for me or riding the M5 bus in Manhattan. Thank you for that. I'm going to take one more question and then close out with a final poem. Anyone? One more. I'm seeing some pointing over there, up there, whomever that is. Okay, go for it. Great question. What advice can I give to people struggling, suffering with or struggling with self-love? Um, not, not only discover the things that nurture your core, but discover your support system and nurture it. So my support system, um, are, have always been the various therapists I've had in my life, lots of therapists. It takes a lot of therapy <laughs> with what I've been through. Um, my family, so a lot of my support system my, is in the front row. Um, and, uh, and the spaces that, that make me feel safer. I don't, know, I don't know that any space can ever be safe because it can be like safe for one person and triggering to another. So finding the spaces that are safer. A lot of activist spaces have been that for me. Um, a lot of books have been really safe for me. So I, I think it's the most important thing is, is discovering what makes you feel safer, uh, and, and especially people. And if there are professionals and teachers and adults that you can find who can help become part of that support system, that's really crucial. And, and also being honest with the, the friends and the community members that make you feel safer. Um, I think that, that support system is vital. So thank you for that question. And on that note, that's actually a perfect segue into this final poem. Look at that. I couldn't have planted it any better myself. So I am honored, uh, privileged, and humbled to have shared space with you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to LFA for having me um, and, and all of you for, for honoring my brother Josh in this way today. So I'm going to close out with this poem. It's called Fierce This House, and I wrote it two years ago when I was going through a really big breakup after a four-and-a-half-year relationship. And I had decided, it, it's like a prayer I wrote myself, because I decided that no matter what happened, no matter how many times I was hyperventilating in fetal position on the floor, which I did, or how painful it got, I wasn't going to let it destroy my self-worth. And so... Uh, the, the last answer to your question is to write yourself a prayer. <laughs> I will be bigger than heartbreak. I will be stronger than the empty choking guzzling my chest. I have sat alone at the largest canyon edge in southeast Utah and felt infinite, so I will not be afraid. I will love this love's extinction into the depths of the universe. I will scout my own way. I will birth the gully in my throat into a thousand redemption songs, and I will bleed light from the contours of my eyes. I will march. I will march. I will march. I will eulogize every now-abandoned kiss with the sanctity of a marriage that will never be. I will sit this shiva. I will grieve this death. I will let my spirit stumble. I will rise again from breath. I will prevail. My heart will birth a thousand doves in the outskirts of the universe, and I will call this freedom.
I will call this love. I will hold myself through every shiver in the bathtub, in the shower, on my side of the bed, on the subway platform, on the phone with my sister, in the car with Chloe, on the curb of 14th Street and Avenue B. I will weep myself into tranquility. I will bless my goddess self and raise my soul above the ground. I will not walk across the desert. I will lift into the clouds. I will thrust a tongue that used to kiss him and thrust it with the fervor of a thousand ancient echoes chanted into the full moon. I will be the full moon. I will light the sky. I will not hold back. I will not silence myself. I will not acquiesce. I will plant this foundation. I will gift myself survival and I will look back one day and know I never even questioned if I would come out complete. I will plant this foundation. I will fierce this house. I will burst this roof. I am not afraid to crumble. And if I cannot keep my word sacred, I will forgive myself for I am no saint. But I will be my own savior. I will carry my whole breath. I will rise into the sunset. I will empower, resurrect. Thank you, Lake Forest Academy. And with that, morning meeting has now come to an end. Thank you so much. <laughs>